Uh, it's not a public, or it is a public holiday there. It's a delayed Queen's birthday, apparently. And uh, yet, Assistant Minister Jane Prentice has decided to come into the Brisbane studios and join us for To the Point. Thanks so much, uh, Minister, for uh, being part of the program. Pleasure, Christina. Hello, Michael. Jane, nice to see you. Now, you, you're not, you didn't have much to celebrate on the weekend when it came to football, uh, Minister. It was um, a Queensland no. free grand final series. Yeah, and I can say, you know, a loss only for sport that Queensland wasn't part of it. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, but a, a lot going on. Uh, we do, I want to start with this uh, report in The Australian about the news poll analysis showing that the Turnbull government's uh, struggling uh, in all states, but particularly in Queensland. Mm. Uh, there seems to be a real concern about uh, this, this state of Queensland, with a number of seats on a knife edge there. Uh, you know, what do you think is going on there, uh, and, and, and what, what can the Turnbull government do uh, to arrest its fortunes in Queensland? Uh, well, Malcolm's here at the moment opening the new Redcliffe Railway, so I'm sure that'll be very popular. But uh, look, I looked at that poll, and it's actually not a new one, it's an analysis mm. of the last couple of months. And so a lot of that would be reflected in uh, that we hadn't made changes to uh, the uh, backpacker tax. We hadn't made changes to superannuation. There was a lot of uncertainty coming uh, into uh, this government with the Senate as it is. Uh, and uh, th the figures I saw it was only 5,000 voters. So I think with Malcolm's two really good weeks in Parliament, uh, I think those numbers will change dramatically going forward. Mm. Jane, can I just go back to Christian Porter's uh, rather profound speech recently to the press club, which was a very, very important speech, I think one of the most important speeches given by a government minister since the election, where he basically said, look, we're one of the wealthiest nations in the world. We spend, what is it, $150 billion a year on welfare, um, you know, which is getting up to 10% of GDP. Um, you know, are we that poor, are we that sick, are we that needy that we need to spend this amount of money? And he talked importantly about the welfare trap, which was a very important piece of analysis where he's talking about those examples of the young kids that get into carers' positions to, to a laudable objective, to look after sick and elderly parents, but then they tend to get trapped in that welfare state and don't tend to get out of it. So my point, was, my point is, what was the thinking behind that speech? Because most previous ministers have been very, have been unwilling or scared to talk about the problem we have in Australia today. Yes, Michael, I mean, it's something we do have to look at. And uh, as Christian said, it's, it's wrong that we've got, for example, 11,000 carers under the age of 20. Uh, now, those young people, predominantly mm. girls, uh, could get caught in welfare. They suffer from lack of education or impact on their education and schooling and we've got to do better and as you say up until now people have sort of said it's such a big uh, issue it's too hard to sort of reform it and I'm delighted that uh, the government's decided that we have to take it on we have to be able to do things better we've got to help those young carers and actually there's more than just young carers there's something like 2.7 million unpaid carers in Australia today now, we've also got the challenge that many years ago, uh, if you were parents of a child with a disability, there was a pretty good chance that you'd outlive that child. So parents kept the child at home and cared for them themselves. But as medical uh, improvements have come along, what we're finding is that parents are starting to outlive those children. So it's important we also mm. empower those people with a disability to be more independent, uh, not to be... Uh, completely reliant on their parents for everything and uh, that's something we're looking at through NDIS as well. Mm. Uh, Jane, uh, the real outtake for me of Christian Porter's speech was not so much that he looked at, you know, trying to cut the overall um, uh, spending on, on, on pensions and welfare services because really a lot of that goes to older Australians you know, and, and no one's really suggesting we're going to move you know, retired older Australians back onto the workforce. Uh, but he did look at those very discreet groups, uh, young parents, young carers, these are manageable numbers and it's not just about the amount of money we pay them now but it's about 
as Michael points out, trapping them in a in a in a low paid or or um, life's uh, low paid jobs or indeed no jobs at all because of this particular short period of their lives. So this. Um, this this program, the Try Test Learn, I'm really quite interested. You know, it's 96 million dollars. Uh, it did seem to me it was a bit like government saying, "Well, we don't have the solution, so we're going to try and see what the sector, the community sector, the employment sector might be able to help us with." You know, what can we expect next in the rollout of that package? Well, Christina, as you said, it's, it was quite unusual. The government actually said, "We don't have all the answers, but we believe the sector itself." Uh, probably has got some innovative ideas and programs that they want to try and test. And that's what we're prepared to do. And Minister Porter said we want to try some new ideas uh, that can break the cycle, that can support young carers. Uh, and submissions actually open in December this year and we're inviting everyone to come up with um, a trial or a test to try and break that cycle and try and support uh, particularly the young carers uh, who uh, are sort of getting caught with at, at a crucial stage of their life, you know, at a time when they should be uh, sort of develop, finalising their education, uh, socialising, uh, enjoying life. They're caught at home, caring usually for a family member, uh, and that will impact on them uh, for the rest of their life. And it's very important that we support them at that point uh, and try and break that cycle. Joan, can we talk a little bit for a minute about the disability support pension? Now, you know, it's a measure of the quality of governments in Western democracies, how they treat those less fortunate. And it's great that we have a pension to support those people who can't work. But we did see over the recent years an explosion in the number of people on the DSP, up to, I think, 830,000. And the government changed the requirements, as, as, as people know, from, you know, not your own doctor, but to a government-appointed doctor. And we've already seen a drop in the, those on the DSP, I think, from 830,000 to 800,000. So what do, you look, what, what do you think about that change? What are the reasons for that change? And where do you think the DSP is going in the next few years? Do you think there have been people on that pension who perhaps should not have been there? Well, clearly there were people who not only shouldn't have been there, but didn't want to be there. And I've had that uh, with constituents in my own electorate, uh, where it was easier for the provider uh, to sign them up for a disability pension uh, than to find them employment. And that's uh, completely changed now, and there's an incentive there for people to get a job. And people with disability really do want to work. They want to get out there. They want to be part of the community. They want to be uh, sort of upskilling. They, they want to make a contribution and we need to support them uh, in doing that. And we've uh, got some wonderful providers out there. I have to say I'm very disappointed uh, that the uh, disability employment figures in Australia uh, haven't been rising. They've actually been going down. We actually rank 21 out of 29 OECD countries when it comes to employing someone with a disability and we've got to do better. Um, I'm delighted the Australian Business Council, uh, who I've been speaking to, have agreed to host a roundtable discussion with employers. And I think we probably need to focus on employers and supporting them. Mm. There's a great uh, provider in um, regional Victoria who started Job Shadow Day with local employers. And uh, for one day a year, they have someone with a disability shadow a job that they think they could do in a business in that area. And uh, they've found that following that, employers have often changed their view about whether they could mm. cope with having someone with a disability and they've increased employment in that area. But we need to do better mm. and uh, we need to focus on supporting people who want to work. Mm. Uh, people with disability are very loyal employees. Uh, as I said to someone, you know, they usually turn up early, um, they don't have five coffee breaks before they start work uh, and they don't tell the manager <laughs> how to do their job after two days, <laughs> as some people do. Mm. <laughs> I, I agree with you on a number of things there, uh, Minister, because I, as a former Minister for Disability Services myself, I can attest to both the uh, importance of getting a person with a disability into employment for them and for the community and also the benefits. But I also want to ask you about jobs under the NDIS. I mean, I do think one of the most undersold aspects of the NDIS is its job creation. 
innovation uh, uh, potential for Australia. But I'm also interested in mm. this idea of whether we'll be able to fill those jobs with Australians or whether we'll be looking for skilled migrants uh, to come in and help fill those positions. Well, with the growth in the area, um, we can probably handle both. Uh, there's definitely going to be a need for uh, several hundred thousand more jobs in that area. I think uh, uh, the minister, current minister in New South Wales, John Ajak, has estimated another 60,000 uh, jobs in New South Wales alone. Uh, and it's on uh, various uh, levels. Some of it is in the carer and support area, but particularly in the provider area. Because uh, under NDIS, where we're trying to help people with severe disabilities uh, lead an independent life, uh, they want to try new things. It might be something like hydrotherapy or uh, occupational therapy or even pottery or art classes. But there's going to be um, a big need uh, to support uh, people who want to get out and try something themselves. So there are going to be lots of job opportunities. There's going to be um, opportunities under accommodation as well in a whole range of areas. Uh, so uh, I've been saying to many people this is a future uh, employment opportunity, the service sector. And of course many of the skills that people will get in caring for people with disability also translate to caring for the aged care sector. And of course that's a growing need as well in Australia at the moment. Uh, the New South mm. Wales um, government, uh, Christina you might mm. be familiar with this, launched um, a, a skills, uh, skills link to work. So if you've been a carer for, say, a family member, you can go onto this site and have a look at the skills that you've uh, sort of managed to obtain by just caring for someone informally, and you can translate that into a, a CV to apply for a job in the sector. Mm. So uh, we're trying to encourage people who perhaps have done a few years caring for uh, elderly parents and say to them, look, you don't have to be a qualified nurse. There's still going to be opportunity for you for jobs. Mm. Jane, can I just turn to Queensland politics for a minute? Um, we saw the remarkable rise and fall of the Newman government. Um, the Palaszczuk government was seen to start well, but they seem to have tailed off rather badly in recent months. Where do you see that government in terms of re-election re possibility going forward, given the fact that um, it seems to have disappointed a lot of Queenslanders. Obviously, the coalition have had a change of leadership, so they've had their own issues. But we, how do you see the next state election unfolding? Uh, well, Michael, it's going to be interesting whether the state government decide to go on the old boundaries um, or they bring in the redistribution because that will actually increase the number of seats uh, and that might make it more of a challenge for them. Um, I think the problem is that uh, we've seen a lot of talking but not much doing and uh, that's uh, a challenge uh, for Anastasia and there's been a fair bit of sniping from her own side which uh, hasn't helped her either. Uh, so they really need to make some decisions and get on with delivering for Queensland. Uh, we saw today the opening mm. of the Redcliffe Railway, but that was, of course, with the support of the federal government. And as um, Prime Minister Turnbull said at the time, uh, they need to land on some major projects and then get on with them. All right. Mm. Uh, well, we'll see how that plays itself out. It was nice to see the uh, Labor Premier and the... Uh, coalition Prime Minister though there today in, the, in, do, in opening some infrastructure in your state so that's got to be a good thing for everyone uh, but Minister Prentice we're out of time thanks so much for joining us on To The Point today. Pleasure Christina. Thanks Michael. Thanks Jane.